Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello. Today, I wanted to talk about consequences and repercussions. Customarily, when you hear that, that phrase and those words, you think of that being the result of something you did wrong, something that is a vice or something you shouldn't have followed through on. And the immediate action would be what you would clarify as consequences and repercussions. But today, I'm not using it in that sense. And I assume that we are all of like mind and we're trying to do things the right way. So it's not said in the vein of doing something wrong. Rather, it's said in the vein of doing something right. Yes. Even when we do the right thing, there's still consequences and repercussions yes. to our actions. An example of this, I would like to uh, point out through turning to Luke 14. Luke 14, and starting in verse 27. Christ is speaking to his audience, and he begins by saying, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And he's just stopping here, this phrase, bear his cross, in those days when the Romans would crucify people, you were made to carry the plank that they were going to use to nail you to. They, they weren't actually carrying the T-shaped the cross on their back. It was the, the plank that they had their arms extended to. That alone, they had to carry that. It was rather uh, substantial weight. And in the Christ of Christ uh, sufferings, you saw he had gone through a scourging before he carried that. So it was taxing to begin with. And so there's some degree of burden there. There's some degree of repercussion or consequence to following Christ, he's saying, that you have to carry and deal with. Continuing on. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish? And he continues to elaborate how this would play into what he's saying, how you need to count the cost and pay attention to provisions towards doing what you need to do. Jumping down a little further, or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And again, he continues to elaborate, to explain that there, is, there are repercussions that we must anticipate, that we must uh, be ready to encounter. Now, I skipped over those rather speedily, because when was the last time any of you built a tower? And when was the last time any of you had a standing army and you had to go fight somebody else? The, the, the example doesn't necessarily jive with the way we think. And it may not hit home the same way in terms of thinking of how we need to make preparations. So I'll give another example. Each and every one of us coming here today, in our minds, planned how much time we allotted ourselves to get here. Whether we're driving, whether we were taking the train. Weekend traffic, trains run differently, traffic may be differently depending on the route you took. All of that was processed in your mind. You counted the cost. You anticipated any possible repercussions to the actions you were going to take. And if something were to go awry, you have in your mind what you're going to do. You have another train you're going to take. You have another route that you may take. That makes it so we can understand how we're, we're thinking, how we're, we're planning before we set out on a venture, before we set out to follow God, God is saying, you want to do it so that you're able to bring it to completion. So the last sentence of, of his thought, he, he, he surmises. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. In the sense of not releasing yourself from the, the desire to not be burdened, from the desire not to contend with those things that that will confront you when you do do the right thing. The popular notion of popular Christianity is that it is a pastime of convenience. When we're following God in the right manner, that luxury 
of a pastime of convenience isn't appropriate. It doesn't fit. It won't fit the, the lifestyle that we'll find ourselves confronted. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense of understanding that there's a certain aspect of life that we have to deal with, things that we have to confront, repercussions, consequences to our actions. Although we're doing the right thing, there's an equal response to what we do. Once that is established, then there's a sense of orientation in how we think and in our views and our, our, our outlook. An example of that can be found in, in Luke 13, if you just turn over. Luke 13, in verse 1, we find Christ is, again, speaking to his audience. And he's, he's making a point that establishes uh, an orientation, a way of thinking, an outlook, a perspective that we are to carry. Once we already understand that we will confront certain aspects, certain uh, responses to our behavior, even though we're doing the right thing, even as we're following God, that there are responses to that. So starting in verse 1, there were present at that season some who told them about the Gal Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So initially, with the story that's being set up, is something happened in their current events where uh, some Galatians had some sort of uh, interaction with Pilate. These interactions were actually quite typical of Pilate's governance. He was always butting heads with the Jews to the degree that he would oftentimes be seen as being heavy-handed, and he would get in trouble by his superiors with the Romans, and the Jews would complain. And in much the same way that we have in our society issues that crop up of uh, racism or police brutality, this was typical for Pilate when he interacted with the Jews. So although this specific incident may not be reported elsewhere, there were other incidents similar to this <clears throat> where Pilate would have uh, these run-ins and he would have these heavy-handed responses where people were killed or would die. It was typical of what Pilate did. Continuing on, and Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Christ is pointing out that there's an orientation that we must have an understanding that there's a, a greater sense of something that we have to answer to. There's a greater problem that we have, a bigger issue that goes unnoticed or unrecognized. And this was what he was in, emphasizing to them. Although these individuals that had died, they were under uh, a, a call, a call of, of, of death because of overall society oh. sins and the detachment from God that they had to answer, although seemingly untimely. We all have to answer that. And it is that perspective that we live and we, we, we function in, and that's what Trump, Christ was trying to, to drive home. And so oftentimes, there's certain aspects in life that seem to get hidden. Death is one of them amongst many other things. It's hidden, it's sequestered, it's pushed away to the side. Our sick and our ill, they're, they're, they're in hospitals, but they're, they're kept, and, and oftentimes, they're, they're not in squalor. You would never know sometimes if you weren't aware that that was a hospital. And I get the point of, of kind of uh, having people off to the side uh, so they don't contaminate others. That's not what I'm referring to. There's a sense of removal of how harsh death is from our eyes. And even though a hospital is filled with those that are sick, there comes a time sometimes where people reach a point where they're terminally ill and there is no recourse. And what do they do? Another level of being hidden. Now you, you put them in a hospice. There's another room, another building, again, removed away even more. So particularly young people, as you're moving about and you're getting older, there's certain things you're not seeing about life that are real. And then when it hits us, when it hits home, as it has in our congregation recently, it stinks. 
And the thought that reality is surreal is rather weird, isn't it? Death is reality, mm -hmm. but it's surreal yeah. when we confront it. Yeah. And this is what Christ is trying to point out. Mm -hmm. You go to the supermarket, everything is ready-made. I didn't know peanut. I don't know where peanuts grow. I it's I don't come, mean to come off that ignorant, but <laughs> I I don't know. They're in a jar to me. <laughs> the fruit that grows on trees, the animals that 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 we have processed for us, I have no interaction with these things. So everything is packaged for me. I have no sense of the the chain of life that transpires from the beginning, from the ground, from life, from the trees, until death. And this is what Christ is emphasizing here. Continuing on, he cites another issue or a, a, another aspect that took place in his current events. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Again, making the point, there is a, a greater sense of awareness that we are to have in following God and recognizing that there are consequences and repercussions to following God and have our mind oriented in a way so that we can understand that. Sometimes as we're living and, and trying to maintain this degree of orientation, we may want to choose our consequences and repercussions. And uh, instinctly, who wouldn't want to choose the consequences and repercussions that are a little bit more comfortable? But that is not something that's in, in the cards. And yet, that is our inclination, to have more control over what's happening. And not just that, but even we may want to pick the consequences and repercussions that we deal with, and with our limited vision, our limited sense of immediate vision, we do so in a way where we don't see the bigger picture. And, and, and in so doing, we cut ourselves short and make it more difficult for others that perhaps we were trying to help, or make it more difficult for us. Example, an analogy. Three men are on an island. They've been on this island for quite some time. No way of getting on. But they had each other. In the course of being on this island, they come across a magic lamp. And they rub this lamp, and out comes a genie. The genie explains to these three men that they will each get one wish to do it as they choose, but only one. And the men are, are, are pleased and happy at their good fortune. And they're lined up, ready to, to follow through on this process. So the genie recognizes the first man. And the first man says, I want to go home. Wish granted. The second man recognizes the other fellow just disappeared. He also is anticipating what he will get with his wish. And when the genie recognizes him, the man says, I want to go home. Wish granted. Now, third man's turn has come up, and he recognizes the other two have left. It is now his time to leave, and there's a sense of, of uh, reminiscence of what he had just gone through. And the genie recognizes him, and he, he says, I'm really going to miss my friends. I wish they were here. Wish granted. <laughs> All three are now back on the island. <laughs> In so doing, he wasn't thinking, and in thinking about his own qualities, his own sense of self, he forgot that what he implemented was not in the best interest of everyone. <laughs> Another example of this was rather recent. We had spent some time in a nursing home not too long ago, and the people in this nursing home were challenged physically. And I'm sure it wasn't lost on anyone, that we all thought the same thing to some degree. And I actually heard it mentioned once uh, after services. Just what if any of us had the, the 
means by which God would work through us where we have access to the capabilities to heal the people and individuals that we saw. Some of these individuals may have been incapacitated for years, immobile or, or, or have, just they're, they're unable to move their legs, their, their arms, their vegetables in, in some sense. What if we were able, God working through us, to heal them? And I'm sure many thought that. I thought that myself. But then when you follow through with that line of reasoning, what happens afterwards? Take, say, you heal a person that's been in this condition for 10 years, 15, 20, and you heal them, and now they're mobile and they're able to walk. What's their life going to be like? To our aspect, to our way of seeing it, well, what just happened, all right, we're done. And you walk away. They haven't worked in 10, 20 years. They may have outlived their family. There may be issues in trying to acclimate to the world and get a job and function. Socially and, and, and mentally, how would they deal? What if they need counseling? I work in an environment and in a, a, a career choice where I work with men and women that come home from jail. Some have done 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and when they come home, this is a big culture shock to be around people, to take the trains, to take the bus, to go get a job, to use a computer, to turn on the television, to open the refrigerator, to take a shower. Things that you take for granted, they're going, what is this? This is what would have happened if you healed those people. Not only that, there would be consequences and repercussions, even though it is an act of God. What do you think is going to happen? How's the hospital going to feel? You just opened up a lawsuit. Not only that, the pharmaceutical companies, the, the insurance companies, they're going to be pissed at what you just did. They're going to be after you. You just cost them money. You just cost corporations a lot of money. And now you find these horrific consequences and repercussions to what you did. And what if God had instructed you to do such a thing? You now have all these problems. These are the consequences and repercussions that I speak of when I, I mention that we're following God and we find ourselves tasked with dealing with some of these things. And even though these things may be done today and have been done in the past, there's a mindset that we don't have. We don't have a greater picture. We can't see how things work out and for the good in each and every individual case. It's not our place. We're not capable of seeing things to that degree. In a sense, the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is a, a premise that a loose, small incident, perhaps very far away, could contribute to something happening again, miles away, of, the, of an even greater effect and, and, and fallout. Yeah. Hence, butterfly effect, that a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere in Indonesia would cause a hurricane or a tornado in Texas. Theoretically, this is possible. And again, you do not know what result uh, healing may uh, accomplish or take place in working with someone else. So, with that being said, we turn to John chapter 11. And starting in verse 45. Thank you. Please excuse that pause. You guys got me on camera. <laughs> but there's no shame. In John chapter 11, verse 45, actually, no, uh, starting from chapter 11 itself, we, we find an incident where Christ had uh, very, very close associates. And it's starting in verse 1, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. So Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, they're all related. They're brother and sister. They're close associates of Christ. And Christ had, uh, was, was not on site. He was, was not in the area at the time. And Lazarus had fallen ill. 
And he wasn't just sick, he didn't have a stomach ache. He was sick to the point that he would die from uh, his sickness. And so they sent word to Christ that he was sick, which of course is what you would do if you had that kind of associate and you, 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 you knew God at, and, and in the form of a man like that, you would reach out to him for hopes of getting assistance. Nonetheless, uh, when Christ got this information, he didn't come back immediately. It's as if he understood how he wanted things to play out for the greater good. There was a purpose to what he was doing. But nonetheless, uh, we, we find he's talking to his disciples and he informs them of what is happening at home and his plans. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, starting in verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Again, he fell back a little bit and didn't come back immediately. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. Christ had previously already had problems in that area. He already experienced consequences and repercussions to the way he was living, the things he was doing, the things that he had said. And in verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you were going, to, and you were going there again? Now their mentality is, we just left because we had problems. We had consequences and repercussions, and now you want to go back. Mm -hmm. They had consequences and repercussions from the way they were living, from doing the right thing, from, from bringing uh, messages from God the Father to the people, and this is what they had to deal with. Dropping down, uh, Christ further elaborates that, that he's going to go back in spite of that. And in verse 16, then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, in a sense a little sarcastically, let us also go that we may die with him. Meaning this guy is so going to turn around and walk right back into trouble, knowing full well why we left. And here we go right back into it, consequences and repercussions. And so we may find in our own personal lives, from the way that we're living, that we encounter consequences and repercussions with our family, on our jobs, with school, with our kids schooling, with, uh, with, within ourselves and our own thinking. Consequences and repercussions in being of uh, Afro-American, Afro-Caribbean descent and having to explain why you're keeping customs that customarily are attributed to those that don't necessarily look like you or share the culture that you may have had in your upbringing. And sometimes you'll get a harsh response, consequences and repercussions. So continuing on, Christ and disciples, they return back to the area. And dropping down to verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. It, it, it appears that perhaps Mary wasn't aware that he had come back yet, and uh, he kind of laid back more towards the burial site. And when Martha got word that he had arrived, she went out to speak to him rather discreetly. And it seems that she had family at her home, the way we would have when uh, we have a loss and, and, and family comes over with food and, and they'll offer support and everyone is, is gathered together, she stepped out rather discreetly to go speak to him or perhaps uh, give him a word or two. There's a sense of she was pissed. She knew he was capable of, of fixing this situation and he didn't come back. So there, there's some real uh, disappointment there. Now Martha said to Jesus when she arrived, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now how often do we hear that phrase, that understanding, that mentality? When we ourselves deal with death, when it touches ourselves personally, even though we have that right orientation, even though we understand the, the prospect of, of how death is over us and how we've been given a chance to have that removed, and in this conditioning period, in this period of judgment with developing character and using God's spirit to do so, dealing with the, the things that we encounter, 
But when we have death touch us and that sting touch us, and we're told that our loved ones, our friends, our associates will rise again, sometimes it isn't sufficient. And again, our congregation has encountered this, has encountered death. And you may feel like, why dwell on this? Why bring this up? I was feeling fine this morning. Why do you have to talk like this now? And, and, and it, it, it doesn't go away. We, we experience losses, be it our sister, be it our brother, be it our, our parents, our mother, our fathers. And it, it does hurt. It does sting. And especially when there are moments where everyone seems to come around and provide support, but it's when that support drifts away. Everyone's coming to your house, and everyone's calling, but then the call stopped. And then the visitors stopped. And now you're on your own. Now you gotta deal with that. And then when you hear your brother will rise again, it's like, really? It won't change how I feel. It doesn't make anything better. And here you go, you're hearing it again today and it still doesn't erase what you're feeling. This is what Christ was doing to Martha, and her response is the same as our response would be. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again, yeah, 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 in the resurrection at the last day. That's the response that we give on the inside, sometimes outwardly, and that's what she's doing. But again, we understand that there was a different intention and we understand how this played out. We understand that that stone was rolled away and, and Christ called out and Lazarus came out. And as a result, consequences and repercussions, dropping down to verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And they're going to this guy. He's like, took it too far this time. Now he's raising dead people? He's got to go. <laughs> and one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. His mentality is, this guy is going to cause such an uprising that Jerusalem and Judea itself is not going to be able to hold up on their own. They're, you're not, they're not going to be able to overthrow Rome. And everybody's going to get wiped out. And for what? And in the end result, we're going to lose our posh jobs. We're going to lose our places. We're going to lose our pensions. We're going to lose all of this because this guy is running around doing tricks. And he had done one trick too many, too strong, too vibrant, and it was threatening the status quo. Consequences and repercussions to doing the right thing. And oftentimes, we find ourselves in that same throes of doing the right thing. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, Christ at Count the Cause recognized that these consequences and repercussions are part of the conditioning and to anticipate it and be ready for it. And dropping down, in to verse 53, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. So there were consequences and repercussions that he had to contend with. Jumping now over to chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. So he's there with Lazarus and Martha and Mary again, and they're having dinner. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him, with Christ. Still in chapter 12, jumping down to verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might see also see Lazarus, mm -hmm. whom he had risen from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. 
because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So the same scenario where many of us were at that nursing home, thinking those thoughts, but unable to follow through as we do not have those kinds of means. Here, this actually took place. And I'm sure Lazarus was grateful to be alive again. Yeah. He was accustomed to the throngs of people that would follow Christ. He was an associate of Christ. But there came a time where he would go home. And when he would go home, Christ is still continuing with his following and his ministry. But Lazarus could go home and relax. And it's quiet. There were no paparazzi at the door. Mm -hmm. But now, now he's been raised from the dead. Not only does he have this following and this clamoring of people, now people are out to kill him. Consequences and repercussions. We find ourselves dealing with these things, even though we're doing the right thing and living in the right way. John 15. John 15 and verse 20. Christ, in speaking to his disciples, uh, reminds them, and that reminder would hold true for us. In verse 20, chapter 15. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Yes. So again, as we follow in Christ's footsteps, as we emulate that what lifestyle, we will find potentially ourselves falling into similar circumstances, possibly not as grave and dramatic as some of the things we read about happening in the Bible into the early church. But nonetheless, these are things that we need to recognize and be prepared to deal with as part of the package and then following God. Mm -hmm. Now, the church of the whole in that day, from then all the way till now, has had to deal with consequences and repercussions. If we turn over to Revelations, we will find and the messages that Christ had to the churches mentions of these consequences and repercussions that these churches had to contend with. The letters to the churches were to churches that were in cities along a particular mailing route. And this mailing route was in Asia Minor. The churches uh, had small congregations in, in a particular region. So you had Asia Minor, but then you had other areas in, 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 in Rome to the west. So the church had begun to grow starting in AD 31, and, and it began to prosper, and a lot of people were brought in. But over time, things began to change. Over time, heresies began to be drawn into the church and other ways of thinking, uh, false doctrines began to creep into the church. And you would read uh, through Paul's letters and the letters of the apostles, them having to contend with all of these things. And we see mention of some of these things as the churches in each of these eras deal with some of these consequences and repercussions. Firstly, Christ begins to speak to the church at Ephesus. And these, these churches, these eras, are also looked at as being representative of, of characteristics that the church would have throughout the years. So you have instances where these descriptions were true to the people in the church congregations at the time, and they would be true to the church eras that would follow as time went on. There are even some that would say that these church eras were reflective of the Old Testament church. And that also is an interesting way of looking at it and see how those things are compared. Nevertheless, in, in, in chapter 2, Christ is speaking to the uh, church at Ephesus. And in verse 2, he says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my namesake, and have not become weary. So you have instances, as we've read in, in the book of Acts and in the letters of Paul and the apostles, that there were attitudes and peoples that would bring about ways of, of living and thinking that were not biblical, that were not doctrine, that were not appropriate to God's way of living. And they would draw people away with this. 
And these were things that they had to contend with all the time. This is what that is referring to. And oftentimes when you read these, these descriptions of the churches, there isn't a lot of argument when you're reading about things that happened in the past, because it's history. It's easily verifiable. There isn't too much argument there. But when you start getting closer to contemporary times, that's where things get a little hazy and grayish, and then people have different interpretations about what things may mean. Right now, we're pretty much in the safe area of, of even scholars understanding this, these are the things that are being referenced. Continuing on, nevertheless, I have this against you. Christ is talking to this era at Ephesus. Again, this being around the period of uh, about 80, 31 onward up until about possibly 80, 135. That period of time where uh, the, the gospel had been preached to many, many areas and people were responsive. But as time went on, Christ didn't return yet. That started to wear people down. But people start dropping. Apostles are dying. Uh, James was the first to go at about AD 44. The, the temple in Jerusalem fell. That was AD 70. About AD 67, Paul gets killed. 67, 68, Peter gets killed. And, and then one by one, the other apostles in, in other areas and regions, they start to die. So that the people that brought this movement that were uh, in, in, in integral to things staying in order, they're not there anymore. There's no one to answer the, the, the things that are being put out there, the sway that now is beginning to take hold on, on the church in this area that encompasses Rome and that area on the west and Asia Minor and those areas would, would be Turkey today on, on, the, on the east. So Christ is addressing this. He's addressing some of these consequences and repercussions that are taking place to the church. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And there's debate sometimes over who these Nicolaitans were, what that would encompass, but it is safe to say whatever it encompassed, it was a group of it was a, a group of thinking. It was a movement that was against what God was doing. It, it was a movement that contained Sunday worship instead of Saturday. That contained Christmas and Easter more so at this point instead of Passover. Yes, sir. And so these were the changes that were starting to take hold, and these changes were taking hold more so on the west than they were on the east. So on the western side, the Church of God. The Church of God was on the West and the East. They were all keeping the same things at one point. And over time, other attitudes and mindsets crept in. There's still the Church of God, though. They're under that name. And yet, these other attitudes start to creep in, and they were more pervasive on the West than they were on the East. Most of, a lot of the people that were uh, dominant in, in, in keeping things right were on the East, like John, who at this point is still alive pretty old. He's probably imprisoned by AD 90. He gets the book of Revelation at this point. But there's some degree of control more so there than on the West. And so those attitudes of Sunday worship, Easter and such, it is, it has infiltrated the church on the Western side. But there's still the church of God. There's still one, one, one group of people uh, in terms of corporate banner type of looking at it. And Christ is addressing that, that a portion of people have resisted this change. Continuing in verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Churches, plural. Churches at that time, churches that would follow from, from that day all the way down to us. Not just the, the areas that we feel these characteristics are most dominant. We, we need to recognize all of these things, these repercussions, these consequences, to these things are taking place for us all, and we need to pay attention to that. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, referring to that actual tree uh, that's uh, in the spirit realm that was in the physical realm that Adam and Eve uh, kind of defunct on. 
and, and we also would have access to that were we to follow through and, and live right and, and come into the, the fullness that Christ would have us come into when we are transferred and translated into spirit beings. But here we have a society in an area where people have begun to stray. And those that kept God's way of life, they're often called Nazarenes or Quattrodecimates. And then that would refer to the, the area in which Christ may have lived. That would refer to when the Jews fled Jerusalem, when it was ransacked, they did come back and they came back to certain areas. Quattrodecimates was also a point of contention in that the Western church was really big on Easter. They had a strong pagan influence. And Rome itself and the government there was kind of making deals with the churches there. You just kind of follow our lead. Kind of take to this way of doing things. And we won't be harsh on you. We won't give you a hard time. But the church in the East, they weren't going for that. And so the church in the West would gravitate to these pagan customs and Easter and so forth. And the church in the East was stuck to Passover, which was on the 14th of Aviv, hence the term quadrudecimal, 14. Mm -hmm. And so following down to the next church, another church where Christ is speaking and, 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 and pointing out consequences and, 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 and repercussions, he then begins to address Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Christ is now citing and recognizing that he was killed and he came back. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. So Christ recognizes that they're rich spiritually, but they're, they're physically poor. And I remember when I was younger reading this, well, my attitude would be, well, you're God, and you know they're poor, so help them out. Why are you letting this slide? But the emphasis, the orientation, is not about their physical comforts. It is about the, the spiritual growth and conditioning that they were to, to, to pursue. Yes, sir. Christ continues on. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So remember I mentioned everybody was one church. They're under one corporate banner. And in the West, they've now dallied into pagan customs and keeping other ways and keeping Sunday. And by this point, we're already in like from 80, 135 to around 155 now. Yep. John is dead. Everyone else is dead. All the apostles. The people that saw Christ alive, no one else is around. The church in the West is keeping these, these false days, but still holding a, a name of Christ, still holding that banner of church of God, but they're not. Not truly, they're not keeping the right way. The church begins to have more of a foothold in the West. And these ways begin to take more stronghold. And this group begins to translate to what we would call the Catholic Church, the Universal Church. This becomes Satan's seed. This becomes the, the other Jews, or spiritually, they see themselves as Jews, as um, we see ourselves as spiritual Israel, as uh, in Romans chapter 2, verse 28, there's a reference to how being a Jew is, is being uh, one that follows God spiritually. Yeah. So the spiritual Jews, they are not, even though they're trying to identify themselves as that, under that same corporate banner. But they're, they're following a completely different way of life. Christ continues, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Now, again, sometimes uh, time could be seen as uh, a thousand years as a day. As Adam was told, this, when you eat that apple, if you do what I told you not to do, in that day, you will die. And people often go, oh, you didn't die. Or his death was delayed. But if a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Then Adam indeed in that day did die at about age 986 or something to that effect. He died in that day. Likewise, this attribution is, is also has the same kind of parallel in that a day is a year in this case. 
And that also could be seen in Ezekiel. I think that's Ezekiel 4, where Ezekiel was told to lie on his side for 40 days, and that 40 days would represent 40 years and so forth. So, Christ is telling the church they're going to have, be persecuted for 10 years. And Christians were, but they were all grouped together. So you have these, this false church on the west, and you have the real Christians keeping Christ's way of life on the east, but they were all persecuted by Rome. So mixed in with this are the true Christians. And that's why when you see the Catholic Church and they talk about all these martyrs, some of these guys, they're not keeping the right way, but they got caught in the flush. And so yes, they got martyred too, but so did the real Christians. And they had to deal with these consequences and repercussions. Christ continues, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Christ emphasizes churches, that all groups are to listen to this then and now through the ages. He emphasizes that those that follow him will overcome the second death. And then Christ continues on to the other churches. And as things play out, there are other events and other things that take place that mirror repercussions and consequences taking place in that day and in history. And it's interesting to see how that plays out. It's also pertinent upon us to recognize that there are consequences and repercussions to doing the right thing. And that's fine. That's part of the plan. And it's not something we should shy away from or feel that something is amiss. And that we should stick to what we're doing. Now, I won't continue in, in traveling through the other churches because there's no time. But I, I think I've made or I tried to make the point that I wanted to make. And perhaps, if indeed I am still going to speak again next week, I'll continue with those other churches and how I was doing. But nonetheless, I want to emphasize that our orientation must be correct. Our sense of what we're dealing with, and be it death, be it uh, other hardships, we, we have to operate within that realm of difficulty and maintaining that degree of orientation in how we're thinking so that we still stay true to what God would have of us Amen. and not lapse like uh, the other groups had, had done in the past and like things are happening today. We must stay true to God in spite of all our difficulties and hardships. Amen.